Good evening and welcome to International House here at the University of Chicago and to this very special program. My name is Denise Jorgens and I am the director of International House. We are pleased to co-sponsor this program through our Global Voices program. Throughout the year, the Global Voices Lecture Series presents prominent speakers and organizes roundtable discussion groups and special interest conferences and seminars. As a part of this program, leading figures from the world stage come to share their thoughts and exchange ideas with students and members of the community on a variety of current topics. Information about many of our upcoming programs is available on the literature table in the entryway. Tonight we are so pleased to be partnering together with a variety of, of groups across the campus. These partnerships are really what make uh, our programming possible. And now I'd like to welcome Mark Lissette, the Director of the Program on the Global Environment to the podium to begin tonight's program. Thank you all so much for coming. Thanks, Denise. I am Mark Lysett. I am the director of the Pro University of Chicago Program on the Global Environment and the interim director of the Center for International Studies. On behalf of those programs and the University of Chicago Center for East Asian Studies, Southern Asia at Chicago, and the International House Global Voices Program, we are all very pleased to welcome you to this screening of Nick Diocampo's film, Cross Currents, Journey to Asian Environments. I invite you to explore all of our upcoming events on our website at pge.uchicago.edu or on our Facebook page. In just a minute, I'll have more to say to introduce Mr. Diocampo, um, who we are very pleased to have visiting us this evening. Um, but first, I want to turn the floor over to a couple of co-sponsors who have asked to say a few words of welcome to this event. First, let me introduce Vice Consul Ricardo Abuela from the Consulate General of the Philippines in Chicago. Good evening. On behalf of the Consulate General of the Philippines and our Consul General, we'd like to welcome you all tonight to this uh, special occasion. We'd like to thank our partners, the University of Chicago. And uh, this particular film highlights two things about the Philippines. Number one is the resiliency of the Philippine people in facing environmental challenges. All of the typhoons coming into Southeast Asia first hit the Philippines before the rest of Southeast Asia. From around 20 typhoons a year, it has slowly been increasing to around 30 to 40. So this increase in the effects of this hazard of the, of the weather, uh, the people of the Philippines and the rest of Asia has adapted. So that's one thing you will see, the resiliency of the Filipino people. And secondly, the skill of the Filipino as a storyteller through film, as what you will uh, watch later on through Nick De Ocampo's film. So uh, once again, uh, thank you for coming and mabuhay tayong lahat. In addition, tonight's event would not be possible without the support of the University of Phil the Philippines Alumni Association of Greater Chicago. Dr. Cleo Casambre is here to represent the UPAAGC. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to say a few words on behalf of my friend Almira Giles, who asked me to represent her uh, while she's in the Philippines now doing a writer's retreat. On this very stage last year, I premiered my composition, Be a Guardian of This Earth. This was a song about water, 
conservation of environment and the need for us to be aware about issues regarding the environment and the need for us to take care of our environment. So the song is Be a Guardian of This Earth and it's, on, it's available in iTunes. Um, I would like to thank the following. University of Chicago sponsor, Center for International Studies, Program on the Global Environment, specifically Dr. Mark Lesset, Director, Andrew Gran, Assistant Director for Programs, Global Voices Program at International House, Mary Beth DiStefano, Denise Jorgens, Director of International House, Center for East Asian Studies, Southern Asia at Chicago. I also thank uh, Consul Ricardo, Ricarte Abihuela, representative of the Philippine Consulate here in Chicago. I thank you all, attendees, particularly those from University of Chicago and the PhilAm community. Last but not least, I thank Nick Diocampo and the Nippon Foundation for their generosity and for bringing awareness to global water resource challenges. Have a good evening. Nick Diocampo is a multifaceted personality in Philippine cinema. He's a prize-winning documentary filmmaker, film historian, author, and lecturer at the University of the Philippines College of Mass Communication. He has won several awards for his documentaries and personal films, beginning with his trailblazing trilogy about life during the Philippines' military dictatorship. Recently, he's embarked on a 10-hour historical documentary about Filipino cinema in 3D animation. Diocampo's academic credentials include an MA in Cinema Studies from New York University. Under a Fulbright scholarship grant, he received his certificate in film in Paris uh, as a French government scholar. He has also been scholar in residence at New York University. Chancellor's most distinguished lecturer at the University of California at Irvine, an international fellow at the University of Iowa. In 2001, he was among the first to be awarded the Asian Pub Public Intellectuals Fellowship Grants by the Nip Nippon Foundation. He is also a member of UNESCO's Memory of the World program, seeking recognition for the preservation of the world's documentary heritage. We are tremendously honored to have Nick here with us tonight. Tonight's film, Cross Currents, combines cinematic power with serious inquiry into community response to environmental challenges. With water as its central theme, this film takes its viewers across five Asian ecological sites and shows how local inhabitants, often without scientific help, have developed indigenous ways of managing their environment. Following the screening, Nick will be available to take questions on the documentary, so I invite you all to join us for what I hope will be a lively and stimulating discussion. Now please join me in welcoming Nick Diocampo's Cross Currents, A Journey to Asian Environments.
nowadays we see the concern of global warming. Everybody want to talk about alternative farming. Yung kalikasan ay hindi lamang dwelling kung hindi bahagi ng kanilang katawan. But we decided to rent a paddy field and we decided to do it in a traditional way. Mendahului dengan kata-kata bahwa ini mata air harus dilestarikan dan kemudian apa namanya diambil untuk dikumpulkan di satu tempat. And before we get started, Nick, let me just um, take my privilege as yes. the moderator to ask the first question or to say a couple of things. Um, it seems to me that this is an absolutely beautiful um, way of talking about nature in the world of ordinary people. And it's, a, it's an amazing world, a world of sustainable practices, a world of indigenous knowledge, a world of community values, um, a wonderful world for a community, and in many ways for nature. And I think about some of the things that stand in opposition to that, not necessarily opposing it, right, but making it terribly complicated. So I think on the one hand of the state, right, which is in some ways defined as not being the indigenous groups in this case. I think also of development agencies, which may be state agencies, they may be the World Bank, they may be situated thousands of miles away from where anything is happening. And I also think about the international NGOs who often work with these development agencies and with the state more than they do with indigenous people. And then on the other hand, I think about the way that every environment is local and every environmental problem is local. But right now, at this moment of global warming, at this moment of rising sea levels, at this moment of high intensity storms and droughts, um, climate that problem is a global phenomenon, right? And many of the stressors come, again, from places that are entirely outside of the realm of the indigenous groups that you're dealing with. And I just wonder if you could reflect on some of those kinds of oppositions or some of those kinds of challenges to the role of sustainable practices and indigenous knowledge and community values. Okay. Um... I'm quite glad that the um, issue of uh, contradiction uh, has um, made an impression with you because that's exactly what uh, uh, I have and my team um, uh, have um, uh, not really discovered but engaged with. You know, these are some of the issues exactly. The element of discovery was really the kind of local responses that uh, we found uh, in the, in those communities, because quite obviously, you know, for academics like us, you know, and I also teach at the University of the Philippines, um, we already have in our minds exactly all these threats that are written large over these uh, uh, communities. Now, um, uh, the reflections that we had there was, you know, this this opposition 
that happens is that um, many times many of these members of the local communities are not really engaged in the um, uh, problem solving that have really been uh, initiated by, as you mentioned very well, the state, by the NGOs and um, all these other multinational corporations that develop uh, places like Tasikchini, for example, or Batanes in terms of tourist destinations or mining areas. And so what happens here is that many times there, there have always been a top-down kind of decision-making. We all know that. But uh, what we try to see right now is this inner resiliency, the inner strength that we also get from the local people. And I think I had been very preferential in this documentary by focusing more on um, what we consider to be um, local practices, call it traditions, call it rituals, that we feel, if listened to by um, the um, uh, representatives of the state or the NGOs, perhaps there could be a dialogue that can happen between the two. I do not, we cannot ignore anymore the presence of the state. Somewhere along the way, you know, listening to all of these discussions, because there have been interfaces that happened between local community leaders and um, um, members of uh, local governments, uh, of NGOs and all that, and we really feel that they cannot exclude each other. They, this contradiction between the two cannot forever um, go on. It's really more of the empowerment of the local communities being heard, and I think if you still remember the last sort of appeal that I had, because I also scripted this film, is that I raised questions exactly of when will our policymakers listen to and consider um, traditional knowledge? Um, when will, will they consider spirituality and perhaps uh, religious beliefs in our policies? I know that the, the problem immediately that comes in would be these are unquantifiable, unqualifiable. So I do hope exactly that you know, we can progress from here. We cannot forever you know, leave everything in terms of contradiction uh, because that will lead, for example, in Tasik Chini, both positions dug in. I think the most severe situation that happens, right, that is happening among these five um, sites that you have seen, and I have just been in Malaysia just a week ago to show this film at Monash University, and it was attended by not only academics but members of local communities. They used the, uh, they, they used the screening as a forum exactly to discuss how bad Tasik Chini has become ever since I shot this film. And there have been several screenings by NGOs, these are more of the uh, activist groups, to really protest against the government. So what happens here if both begin to really just dig in and not listen to each other, then worse things can just happen. Because the government in Malaysia, you know, have um, um, continued with their own practices, but not necessarily giving the local uh, orang aslis uh, the opportunity uh, on issues of uh, you know uh, environmental um, uh, protection which is also connected to more complex issues like ancestral domain so problems here that you see you know are deeper than what they seem to be so my final thing is really you know a dialogue must continually we must never give up uh, with the dialogue between the two communities, getting each other heard. Okay, let's have the first question, please. Hello, um, I'm with the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, um, I have a two-part question, sort of. Um, my work is actually in the V-Science with uh, oh. Negritos. I work with the ACTA, um, and I spent some field work there. I'm actually an ethnoarchaeologist. Um, and so my question for the people that you studied was, how connected are they to the indigenous populations? You spoke of local, but as you know, local are people that are there, but may differ greatly from the indigenous populations. For instance, where I work, there are the Akta, um, but there are the Bukidnan, and there are also Cebuano speakers from the lowlands that are there. But the Cebuano speakers are indeed local. Mm -hmm. So for these local populations, how in touch are they to these indigenous populations that were there that possess these true traditional um, knowledge bases? Mm -hmm. um, and then also, the second one is, you, you spoke with all of these people. How... 
uh, I guess, what is the best, the best way to get the indigenous voice or these traditional voices heard, given the fact that the in government is extremely strong? I mean, we work in the Philippines, but it's extremely strong as to what they want them to do as far as modernity. What is the best method for these indigenous populations to get this into the head that it's, this is extreme? So, it's part two. Um. The first one is, uh, my response would really be, there's a lot of disconnect, you know that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of disconnect, even with the locals. Mm -hmm. Meaning, either these are the lowlanders and the truly indigenous, like the Agta that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. For example, the Orang Aslis. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the clearest um, indigenous group that we have here. But there are two, actually, that I've showed here. One would be the Ivatan of mm -hmm. Batanes. I'm sorry, these are not really in the south. This is yes, in the no. up north, yes. the northernmost uh, uh, set of islands, which have really been disconnected to the main island. And I think the, mm -hmm. the operative idea there is the disconnect geographically, and they are also disconnected um, uh, from the so-called locals, which would be Tagalogs, which would be the more so-called um, mainstream uh, uh, people who have uh, been educated and all that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really see that a, a lot of disconnect. However, let us not totally disregard. The mainstream might be disconnected, mm -hmm. but the most vocal people who are helping to fight the so-called indigenous ones, you know, are also these locals, mm -hmm. all right? Like, um, I go back to uh, the Orang Asli. Um, the... Um, uh, um, uh, 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 Colin Nicholas, the one talking about the ethnic, etc. Okay, his Chinese, uh, his ethnicity is really Chinese, mm -hmm. right? But he's the one facing the courts right now, really pushing the whole agenda mm -hmm. of the Orang Asli cause, from ancestral land to human rights to, to all these issues about uh, um, um, uh, uh, pollution. So the thing is, much as there is a big disconnect to the mainstream population of local people, still we cannot discount the fact that the most vocal the most uh, courageous people who would represent. Yes. And when I mean represent here, in, in almost a true sense of the word, that they really live with this Orang Asli. They're willing to go to jail with these people. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's, that's the first response. The second response is, in what way can the indigenous people really um, uh, express themselves and be heard? Well, the, it takes a lot of forms. Mm -hmm. One can go and, and really protest. There have been protests that, are, that have been going on. These are just pockets right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, how far it can go to a government that doesn't listen, I really don't know. So the, 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 the struggle continues. The Ivatans, however, up north, mm -hmm. all right, uh, it's hard really to talk about locals and, you know, it's really kind of a mixed. Yeah group, uh, which is a big difference in the south where I come yes. from as well, right? Uh -oh. The uh, Agtas, for example, or the Dumagats and all that down south, they seem to be, they're not as ghettoized as we would like to think of them, or the Aitas, mm -hmm. for example, they're now being uh, incorporated, mainstreamed in the society. So they seem to be now, you know, um, uh, representatives from their um, indigenous groups that now really, you know, represent them legally, socially, right. culturally. So that's how I see this situation. Okay, maraming salamat po. Oh, maraming salamat. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Sean Bela and I'm a graduate of the Divinity School here and as such, as a student of religion, I normally see it everywhere. But I found that part of the documentary very fascinating in each of the different places, the role that religion, spirituality, r Good. rituals play. And I want to know if you could talk a bit more about that. In particular, I'm interested in understanding whether um, are, does religion and spirituality provide a um, a source to help them cope with the traumas that they're going through? Um, did, did you see any sort of rituals or religious practices that evolved or changed in response to what um, response to the ecological problems they were going through? And then, how do you say how do you feel that uh, policymakers should utilize those practices? Um, if you could just comment on that. Um, I am so glad because my agenda here with this documentary is really um, to uh, foreground the issue of spirituality as the first line of response that we should consider that as being an Asian trait. Uh, and that's exactly what I want to know. Am I essentializing it? But I just want to make a comparison, for example, with Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's really a lot of scientific 
um, reading of nature, uh, a certain uh, degree of this uh, climate change will uh, cause this kind of effect, etc. I mean, these are people who are not, as I mentioned in, this, in, the, in the dialogue, uh, are not scientists. They're not really um, uh, uh, given all the techni technical, technological things that could help them cope, but rather these are people who for centuries have really survived Although right now, what I really see is that their uh, effort to survive is doubled, tripled because of this climate change that is going on. So what is it that they are holding on, you know, in, in terms of these climac climactic changes? The first thing is that the, um, the, um, their attachment or connection with, with the spirit, with the unseen. And it may be hard for us to believe it. It, may be, it was hard for me to believe it. I was an academic going into that um, ritual, for example, of uh, the Ivatans. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a little anecdote here, just to really underscore the whole idea of, call it spirituality, when your camera that can cost around $10,000 start falling down, when a French woman interviewing, for example, uh, this uh, shaman for almost like three months, and then almost like two nights before, two days before leaving, the place suddenly finds out that all her recordings have been erased, you begin to wonder, what is going on? And then you realize that by talking to these uh, people who have this shamanic knowledge, if you want to call it that way, is that the spirits don't want technology and perfume, two things. So don't have perfume when you go there. And number two, don't bring technology. And where was I? But you see, outside of the ritual season, I was even going right out there into the middle of the sea. Nothing was happening to all my equipment. Then within the, it's called in our dialect, talab, no, efficacy. Within the ritual season, when the ritual season happens, personally, I felt there was this kind of electric feeling going on that I just cannot explain. And until one night, when suddenly the whole island was plunged in darkness and something strange was just happening in my cabin because I was really at the outermost place, and then I went through the strangest experience that I ever had in my life, you know, a presence, just a presence. I, re I thought, will I survive the night? And I was calling all the gods that I wanted to call, and then only for me the next day, and I did survive, when suddenly, you know, I, my, my, my hut was facing east, Pacific Ocean, and then, then when the sun was rising, I just felt overcome with so much energy, and it was almost like a welcoming feeling that, you know, I, I came back to, how would you call that, a, another life, a life, what? But, you know, I started talking to, to, to these people, and then they said, you know, you are being tested and you are being initiated. That the word was really, you know, if we translate it, initiated. So spirituality, I now began to think it's their connection. There is something real that, how can we prove it though? For example, you can see exactly how unbelieving I am when I, I made, with the shots that I have. The, the, the shaman was doing all the prayers and then suddenly I panned my camera or cut into the ocean and I said, you know, he's talking to the spirits and it's for us to decide whether indeed there were spirits out there in the ocean that I showed you or it's just that we have to believe that there are spirits there. So their connection is very strong. Now you may call this as animism, but believe me, 98 to 100 percent of the people of the Ivatans are Catholics. Mm -hmm. Before they go to this ritual, they go to, the, to, to mass, they go to the Catholic priest. There is a healthy coexistence between the two. So then after that, they go into animist sacrifices, but they have to have the blessing of the Catholic Church. It's like us having a revolutions in Manila. We cannot wage a revolution without, you know, the blessing of the Cardinal. And, you know, you, you just put these things together, you know. Um, it's, it's really interesting. Now, the, the thing too with the, um, um, with the orang aslis, for example, why I resorted immediately to ethnomedicine is because they can heal themselves. And what I'm trying to put across here is, will they be able to heal as well the lake? And that brings me to your, I think it is your question, wherein how can their religiosity and spirituality mm -hmm. help, 
you know, bring about change uh, by maybe, you know, bringing this to the level of policymakers. This exact, is exactly the agenda that I have. So, for example, if there are disaster risk management groups, I am now penetrating all of these disaster risk disaster management meetings and conferences being done from island to island in the Philippines. And I show this film and really create that space exactly among policymakers who are given millions by the state to come up with what? With dams, with irrigations, with all of these things, to please consider exactly this local response. Environment is a local issue. It, it, you know, much as we need the state, that's what I'm also trying to, I think we have gone to a more sophisticated level, if you want to call that, that uh, we just cannot disregard each other anymore. I feel that there is the role for the state, but is it an enlightened role? That's what we want from the state. And how do we enlighten them? What are our issues? I listen to the locals, all right, the indigenous. I think I'm getting some of the issues put across. Can you, in, can you incorporate or include in your meetings, in your planning, you know, the whole idea of sensitivity to to the spiritualities, to the traditions that have been practiced by these people for centuries. And they have survived. And I bet they will survive the next centuries despite all of this climate change. In whatever way, they've always been survivors. I cannot predict how they will, but you can very well see that there is resiliency. And that's where I want academics like ourselves to you know, to see is there a science in their so-called random practices, which I'm beginning to think, you know, that's why I'm trying to formulate on the side what may be considered a shamanic knowledge. What is that exactly? I, I knew, I have notes exactly when I sort of went into automatic writing during that visitation. I'm even afraid to look at them, but I feel that there is something systemic thematic and systemic in this production of knowledge. Who is producing it? How it is? Because I have seen how the community accepts and believes and practices a knowledge that comes out from, well, you call him a shaman. But did we, do we, how do we know? I wish to engage myself into that. So one byproduct of this documentary could possibly be, you know, getting to know exactly what this whole new kind of knowledge that have been detached from my more academic, educated, you know, uh, uh, state of being, you know, uh, would possibly lead me. All right, may, I hope I was able to. You know. Oh, but there is definitely a big role of spirituality in this kind of ecological thinking or, or consciousness that I am trying to propose here. Spirituality is at the heart of it. Okay, one other quick question. Um, could you tell me the order that you filmed, filmed the documentary in? The locations, did you film them in a certain order? Not necessarily, because I went there several times. I okay. went there several times, at least three times in each place, especially covering uh, certain cycles of rituals you know, immersed there, uh, immersed ourselves. So it was, um, well, we, of course we started really, we, I really started with uh, Japan. Okay, that was my question. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. I am Anthony from the University of Chicago, the college. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for a very insightful documentary. But I'd like to shift the discussion on a bit of a tangent towards the social aspect of these communities. So we actually know, and you know, I've read a lot, I'm from the Philippines and I've read a lot from local newspapers about urban migration. And this is a common problem for a lot of these communities, especially you know, in Malaysia and Indonesia, where the youth actually think that you know, the city life is much better. And in the process, the transition, you know, the oral traditions of these people are being mitigated, they're being lost, essentially. So I would like your opinion the on that. The clear case that I can show here is really the one in Kalichode. The people who live in that um, uh, river uh, uh, community are really migrants. Mm. And that's why they are marginalized. They have to live along river banks, just like you know, migrants in, the, in Manila who live along Pasig River and are being accused quite directly as the ones polluting 
you know, the place, you know. Uh, they are eyesores, and of course, they, they turn the river into, um, into um, uh, their, their sewerage, uh, their, their dump, uh, they, they dump garbage there. So your question is whether... It's going to be a problem in the future, whether urban migration of, of the youth from these communities to the cities. Well, that's exactly yeah. what they are facing right now. I mean, right. uh, there's no more argument at all whether it's a problem. It is a problem. Problem for both sides. Problem for, uh, for uh, the city, okay, but problem also for the migrant. Are they really accepted? The very fact that they are within the margins, they are in these danger zones, it's a problem for them. What can the government do? So this is exactly where the uh, conflict is happening uh, between the two parties. Uh, so where does this question lead us, whether, uh, because I, I think I've answered the question. Think, yeah, do you think it will persist into the future? Um, with what's happening in Manila, and what happened also in Calichode while we were there, there was a memorandum of understanding that happened, at least that came out from the project that we did, with the Sultan, who is also the, the uh, legislative head, the uh, administrative head of Jogjakarta, all right, to... Um, uh, give them more uh, environmental protection, to um, uh, relocate them, to provide them with some of the necessities and all this. And this is exactly what I'm saying, that something like this has to happen. How far it will really go to develop and to uh, improve the lives of both, you know, both the city, because they also need the land, and also the, uh, the, the migrants, for them to have a good life, or at least a safe life. Uh, this conversation and negotiation must constantly happen. Uh, do I have a clear, you know, I'm, I'm not really a public legislator myself, I think I'm into communication and that's why I sort of emphasize the whole idea that you talk and you communicate. Okay, here's the, the nice thing about what's happening in Manila. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Pasig River, if you may have seen this, you know, it's, it's highly polluted, all right? But the government right now, you know, is uh, uh, taking efforts to really relocate them, uh, together also with the largest TV station, maybe you heard about Channel 2, they just did a, a kind of a, a million marathon, for example, and of course they try, were trying to raise money for that. Several esteros, or squatters areas, something like eight right now, have really been freed of the uh, squatters colonies. And that's a great sign already. Some fishes are beginning to you know, thrive already in the river. Some good signs are there, so never give up, really. Uh, I think that's the issue that we need to have, you know, never give up in terms of communicating with each other. So just one quick question. So in your opinion, are you satisfied with Noi Noi's approach in general? One thing, we need to compare him to the amount, to the, to the, 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 the large, the, the problems that he is facing right now. Mm -hmm. um, one can never be happy with any president who will sit there. But he, I can see that there are improvements that are happening. Uh, I wish he's more proactive, meaning personally proactive, but you know, he keeps on coughing, so I really don't know what, you know. Uh, it looks like you know, he doesn't really have a, a very strong public persona, but some of his policies are right, although something really smelly is beginning to emerge right now in terms of you know, the development funds that are being um, scattered. But is it his fault or is it really the politician? It's really the political culture. So it's hard to put the direct blame on him uh, because I think the guy may have good intentions. After all, he's almost my age as well. So please give us a chance, our generation. I'm doing my best in terms of environment, in terms of art, in terms of gender in the country, hopefully in terms of spirituality. But it's hard to change the world. And I don't think he's the kind of person who beats his breast and says, you know, I want to change the world. It, <laughs> For those people who know exactly the politics in the country, and that's why, you know, with the introduction earlier, you know, I, you know, I started making films during the time of the dictatorship when I was a student. You know, I was part of that whole student movement. That's exactly, you know, it was a do or die thing. And for us to look back, and it's my 30th year, um, 30th anniversary as a documentary filmmaker, one gets to know, one gets to know exactly, you know, what kind of problems we have been facing. And this whole network of 20 years of martial law, you know, one cannot just get over the whole web of corruption and problems that happen in that country. And it's not just my country, of course. Yeah. There are others that are more silent about, you know, what's going on with, with, with their own countries. Yeah. 
Yeah. Morning, Mr. Lampo. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> hello. Uh, excellent documentary. I am uh, Andrew uh, Fisher. I uh, came all the way down here from Evanston. I uh, chair the uh, Environmental Task Force for the Unitarian Universalists for Social Justice. Uh, my main uh, question or uh, comment to you is, uh, and I, uh, you uh, insist on the uh, ability to really communicate uh, and communicate positively with a, quote, win-win uh, situation. And that, that, that is the way uh, we have to uh, define these uh, sit situations, like uh, uh, planting more trees, cleaning up the lake, uh, it will uh, bring more fish, bring more uh, jobs, uh, bring more uh, uh, economic growth, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that uh, businesses like that, government, government like that, like that, and the local people like that. So it's a win-win for uh, everyone. Uh, uh, you just got to uh, try to uh, approach things totally positively from both points of view. Not say the government is the bad guys and we're the good guys trying to fight them, but we should uh, try to uh, uh, communicate with them uh, positively and uh, shake hands with them. Uh, uh, do you have any uh, comments on uh, that? Uh? I've been part of some social, for those who know me, some, you know, a social struggle, very intense social struggle during my time, all right? And um, I've been out in the street, I've been documenting uh, my fellow batchmate students who just fall from, from, from gunfires, all right? And lie dead on the street, all right? How I survived, maybe I'm a coward because I'm a filmmaker. I've got to document all of this. You know, I'm a coward because I run and I, I wish to survive all of these killings. And then, as you can see, you know, I'm maturing, I'm getting old. And in the end, there are moments where in, yes, we will, you know, uh, face the bullets with our bodies. There are moments like that. These things have to happen too. In some countries, I see that this have to happen too. I was just in Malaysia. Earlier, I was in Cambodia. You know, you, you, you know exactly that there are moments in history. America went through that. Come on. But there are moments where in, you know, we can sit down and let's listen to each other. Because whatever you want to think about Pinoy, about this Aquino, the son of the democratic icon, I think he can only mean well. I mean, he's got these big figures, you know, that he has to, you know, a big name to live by. And I don't really think that, you know, uh, he would mean harm or create more corruption and all that. In situations like this, we must also know and sense exactly that perhaps we can talk to this, to, you know, you know to, uh, to certain agents. And it's, it's really a proactive role that we need to play because life is just too short. I mean, that's just how I look at my life right now. You know, I can't forever be protesting. I think we should now become problem solvers. And, 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 and my point here is, and, and, and this is not an innocent Pollyannish answer. My point here about the state is that you have our money. I'm paying my taxes. I have access to that money. Even if these are indigenous people, they, have, they should have access to that money. So I am going to exclude in the equation, equation the state. That is so foolish. That is really the innocent way of solving problems. And they are going to dig in, you know, uh, encourage these this angry people to just dig in and not to dialogue and not to do anything. Compromises will be there, but you can only be fooled if you do not know what you want and what you intend to do. And that's why, as I said, you know, this whole enlightened, engaged talk has to happen. So. There are resources by the state. And it is their responsibility to take care of every, every citizen that they claim to be their own. That is the only right that I would like to insist in. And therefore, these indigenous people must know also, must be very clear. So all that we are asking for is really create a space where you know, these things can be discussed. Well, if things don't work, then, you know, you know exactly, you have your own set of beliefs to go back to and, you know, try another door, try another channel. If it has to be, you know, facing the bullets with your body, 
You know, I've been through that, you know, been there, done that. So, you know, but at the moment, my ammunition is, of course, uh, you know, the documentaries I make, if that makes any sense at all. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, thank you. My name is Karen Rotan, uh, class of 74 from the University of Chicago, currently a green activist and member of the Green Party. And I want to say thank you for this to show us what people are doing in Asia around water. And I'm also a member of an urban forestry group here in Chicago. And I want to thank you for showing the connection between trees and water so well and ask you if maybe in your next documentary you will do more about the forests. So. There's really more to do. I mean, uh, let me just reflect on this with regards to Japan. I mean, you look at this beautiful <laughs> landscape in Japan, as I did, you know, I would go there almost every two, three years, you know, uh, and during this past three, four years, I was in Japan. And innocently, I said, oh, they have very healthy forests. Only for me to realize later on, and I started talking to this activist group, uh, one of them of which is, you know, Imakita-san, that, you know, you're being deceived. This is, again, here, the, the, the bad guy is the state. They started cutting down the, uh, the natural forest and planted you know, the, uh, the, the sugi tree or the cedar tree because it fetched quite a high price uh, right after the war. But then after that, the, the, the price plummeted and then suddenly they find out that, oh my God, they are faced with monocropping. That is a horrendous problem because suddenly all the, um, uh, the wildlife will start eating up the undergrowth and they have, if they have nothing to eat anymore, then they just start going down to the villages and start there you are. The conflict is, is between humans and, and the so-called wild animals. And the thing here is that if you have one kind of tree, you will have one kind of insect, one kind of bird that will eat it. And so the whole biosystem is just totally destroyed and it crushes. This is horrible. I mean, and still the state, of course, will not rescind, will not change the whole policy because... It, it has planted this thing. So the wonderful thing about this activist group, the Soma Nokai, is that with their own money, they just bought 25 hectares and let us show the government. So this is how they conduct their dialogue. Let us show the government. So the local government, at least of, uh, I forgot the name, uh, Shigu Prefecture, I think that's the name, uh, is beginning to listen to them. And hopefully in time, maybe the national government will listen to them. And I'm quite glad that you were able to see. I mean, these are you know, some of the um, pleasures that we get when people get to see the connections that we make, exactly that you know, the, uh, the um, uh, water you know, is really you know, uh, connected to, uh, to, to land. Almost in every film that I have, you know, from the sea, the, f the, 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 the salt water dorado, the seasonal uh, fish that passes through the Pacific Ocean that's being caught by the, uh, by the fishermen, you need a flying fish to bait that. But in order to bait the flying fish, you need to bait it with fresh water shrimp. Uh, shrimp. And the fresh water shrimp comes from, uh, from the river. And the five springs, water springs in that island of Batanes right now, when I was there, only two and a half are still producing water. And I have this aerial shot, which I, you know, made my, the congressman uh, convinced that their forestry is really, uh, how do you call it, it's, it's balding, all right? The mountains are balding. And this is causing exactly their spring water to just dry up. And if there will no, be no more uh, sh uh, spring, as there are no more trees, then there will be no more shrimps. And no more shrimps, then the whole matau fishing, upon which villages you know, would depend their lives upon, then this will just vanish. So this in a capsule, this is a good way perhaps to end this uh, discussion, uh, with great thanks uh, to you, uh, Dr. Lysette, that uh, in the end, I, I, I did my effort, uh, you know, I did my best in this little survey of, of the biosystems that are now all threatened in, in, the in, in, in Southeast Asia and in Japan. But um, uh, I know that this is just tasting the uh, you know, uh, upper crust of uh, the stories, but um, uh, I went deeper into these issues because what can you really say in 10 to 12 minutes per country? 
per issue, ecological issue, which are so complex. So I also made one hour documentaries of it. And uh, here you will fully appreciate other issues like the poaching of the Taiwanese and the Chinese encroaching into the fishing grounds of the Philippines, you know, to add up to these ecological problems. Uh, that the uh, fishermen uh, are facing. So uh, it's getting late, and uh, I really thank you so much for your coming, and I do hope that you know, we're able to at least converse with each other. I may have some my own failings, and I apologize for that, but um, really thank you for um, listening. Thank you, Nick. And yes, please join me in thanking Nick for sharing his, his extraordinary work with us this evening. <laughs>